new book today. We're going to do Timothy, a pastoral lecture. We've got three of them, first, second, and second Timothy, as well as um, Timothy. Three pastoral, uh, we're, we're not going to be doing Timothy, but we will do first and second uh, Timothy. Uh, Titus we won't do, I should say. What does the word Timothy mean, the name Timothy? It, mean, it means valuable to God or uh, 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 dear to God, one or the other, and Timothy was. Timothy was, had, when he first met Paul, he was a teenager. <clears throat> Paul had passed through. He came back about seven years later, and Timothy is now a grown man. Uh, that is to say, at the age of accountability, certainly. And had been well taught by his mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. They were Hellenist, meaning they were Hebrews that uh, believed that were Greek speakers, uh, language-wise, but believed in the Word of God. And certainly Timothy, uh, raised in and uh, taught by his mother and his grandmother, was pretty familiar he was taken with that Word of God. And after seven years, when Paul comes back through, um, he, he adopts Timothy, spiritually speaking, as his own child. So, uh, fantastic. This book tells us basically what we should do as Christians, what, what the doctrine should do for us, and how we should behave ourselves, and so forth. How the law applies in this day, and um, pretty well gives you instructions for the church and the family. <clears throat> Excuse me. Having said that, let's take Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. And it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, I want you to grab that title. I mean, what is an apostle? It's a sent one. Now, how was Paul chosen? Acts chapter 9, he was struck down on the road to Damascus. He was an enemy of the church. He was on his way to Damascus to destroy the church, the Christian church, that is. And Christ struck him down, blinded him, and led him, told him where to go to find the truth, and blessed him. And so it was that he was chosen. And no doubt chosen in the first earth age, no doubt it was a certainty. And he was to have a threefold ministry in that uh, ninth chapter of Acts, in the 15th verse and 16th, to one to the kings and queens of the ethnos, that's the Gentiles, and to Israel. And that's why in Paul's letters you have truth for everyone. So you have to listen on three levels, or listen at whatever level is acceptable to you, and be happy with it. But uh, here we have um, that one that was sent, though he was an enemy to the church, he was converted. And what, what does that prove to you? That God forgives. Also, God's in control. When he chooses somebody from the first earth age, he knows how to pull their chain here to get them back in line and in service. That's what he did to Paul. And now Paul is, is converting many people, Timothy being one thereof. Verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, that means spiritually, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Wants that peace to go to him, giving these instructions to um, to Mopheus, as it would be in the Greek, or Timothy in our English language, valuable to God, and certainly he was. Verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest change some that they teach no other doctrine, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, this, this, why? Well, there's only one doctrine. It's when people turn away from the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ that they begin to get in trouble, in big trouble at that. Why? Because it's traditions of men that make void the Word of God. Christ, in the simplicity that he taught, 
when you pull away from that simple message of salvation, then you are really leading yourself astray into the wiles and elements of the world that you can be very entangled within. And they can mislead and, and um, destroy. Verse 4, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, here a lot of people would say, well, then you're not even supposed to think about genealogies. Then you're not a very good reader of, of what is said in the Word, if that's, what, that's your conclusion. Because if we were to destroy genealogies, we would have to do away with a lot of Genesis, with Kings, with Chronicles. Uh, you'd just have to almost take them right out of the Word of God. But, well, what did he mean then? Fables. That's false genealogies. That's what you want to look out for. And endless genealogies, meaning going in and making something out of something that isn't there. Otherwise, you stick to facts. It, is, it was never any more important that the lineage of Jesus Christ, if you did not follow his genealogy in the Word of God, you would, you would not know, for one thing, that um, Mary... His father was of Judah, the tribe of Judah, king line, but her mother was a Levite, meaning of the priest line. So in Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, Christ was both Levitical and king line. That means both priest and, priest and king, king of kings, lord of lords, both offices. And genealogy, especially in Luke chapter 3, documents that. That's a genealogy that is supremely important. It certainly isn't a fable, and it certainly isn't endless. Verse 5. <clears throat> now, to the end of the commandment is charity. That's, that's love. Out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. That means that is... Um, Genuine. Faith that is genuine. Faith in the Almighty God and trusting everything He says to the point that you can trace, did God really say it? Well, go back to the manuscripts. Then you have documentation. That's what separates some would-be scholars from some scholars. That's not endless. That's simply being intelligent enough to know this King James written in 1611 is a fantastic Bible. But it was taken from manuscripts that were written back when Paul and Timothy walked to Sora. And well, what language? Well, well it was, they were Hellenists, so it was in the Greek. Okay. And they could speak, Paul could speak more languages than anyone. He could, he was, uh, of that day. He was a Roman born, his father being a citizen of Rome. And certainly he could speak the Roman tongue. The Hebrew tongue he was very familiar with. Aramaic, very familiar with. The Greek tongue, he spoke colloquial Greek, street Greek you might call it. And, um, and, and, and could communicate with just about anyone. So uh, how precious it is. But, but what of all the gifts, what comes first? Love. Loving what you're doing. Loving the Lord. What, what does he want from you? He doesn't want your burnt offerings. He wants you to love him. And in loving him, you would surely, I mean, if you truly, genuinely love God, you want to really analyze the letter he has sent to you telling you how to be happy, telling you how to be content, telling you how to please him. You would surely do that, would you not? In other words, love brings that forth. Love causes you to be a deeper scholar than, that is to say, deeper in the simplicity in which Christ taught. For from, for which some, having uh, severed, uh, served, have, turn, have severed, have turned aside unto vain uh, jangling, uh, swerved aside. You know what this jangling is? It's a bunch of ratchet jaws. 
In other words, people that like to just talk, talk, talk more than what is written. And when you change away or swerve from the real true word of God, and you, you want to jangle ratchet jaw, I don't know, maybe you've never run across a ratchet jaw in your lifetime. Um, that's somebody that can really talk, but it never makes any sense. And if you ask them to document that in the Word of God, they say, you must be a non-believer, or they'll pass it off something to that light. They will not document it. Why? Because it can't be. So uh, vain jangling is something you want to stay totally away from. And, uh, and so it is. And uh, that is the group. that They lose sight of the truth by getting too far off the beaten track. Uh, and, and so it is. Verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In, in other words, um, they, um, they probably don't know the difference between ordinances, statutes, and commandments, and the law itself. They wouldn't know the difference. And try to set themselves up as teachers when they could not tell you the ceremonial law that was done away with from the true law of the commandments, which God, Christ himself would say in Matthew I don't change one jot, not even one little letter of the law. I came to fulfill it, and he is the fulfillment thereof. In becoming our Passover, and becoming the very living word walking among us, to teach us, and to lead us, and direct us. You don't want some other um, facts by man desiring to be a teacher, and doesn't even know the difference between an ordinance and a law? Let's, let's take an example. What does the commandment say, thou shalt not steal? If you think that law doesn't exist to this day, you're sadly mistaken. It does. You don't want to try it. You'll, you'll end up in much trouble. But at the same time, as far as um, bloodletting or offering a sacrificed animal, that's a, a blood ritual ceremonial law done away with. What? Nailed to the cross. That's an ordinance, not a law. And certainly a teacher that doesn't know the difference between law and ordinances is in a heap of hurt and probably will mislead many people and confuse the issue whereby uh, it throws a cloud over the very word of God and can not and can cause clarity to darken and um, be false. That is to say, you get so far off the track, you swerve totally out of that path. Verse eight. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. If a man understands the law and he uses it lawfully, it is good. Why is that? Well, it keeps you out of trouble. If you follow the law, you're not going to get in trouble. Unfortunately, none of us are perfect. And sometimes we might even break some of the health laws. Um, and you're going to pay for it when you do. Because God writes for a reason. It's good if you do it God's way. You'll be healthier if it's health laws. And if it's the laws which we live by, church laws, uh, community laws, governmental laws, you're going to stay out of trouble as best you can in obeying and doing that that is lawful. You see, many people have the idea that the law is bad. No, it's not. Law is good. It's man that is bad because man breaks those laws. And that, that is where trouble begins. Verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers, that's somebody that lies in wait for no reason, of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. In other words, the, the law certainly is very much in effect. It wasn't made, if a person that never breaks it, 
doesn't have to worry about the law. And a truer statement can never be made. As long as you obey the law, you've got nothing to worry about, basically. Verse 10, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, any kind of perversion, for men stealers, for liars, that is to say people that enslave people, and people that lie, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. See, that's one of the simplest ways that you can tell whether a law, is, whether you're following the law, is it sound doctrine? Does it apply to God's doctrine? Does it apply to Christ's doctrine? That is to say, his message. And certainly, if it is sound, and if it obeys the law, you're not going to have to worry about any of those things forementioned. Because it is the law does not apply to you, it applies to them. No, beforehand, God intends. Man will probably, through law, make you pay part of it. But God intends for you to know, let it be a marker, He's going to make you pay for it. Why? Well, you broke His law. And He sits on the throne... He's in charge. What do you think he's going to do? So therefore, there better be a lot of repentance and a, a lot of going to that throne in prayer and asking God's forgiveness when you fall short and ask his blessings instead. Because one of the greatest gifts, as he said, coming out the gate is charity. That's love. Letting God know how much you love him, how you love his word. And... Uh, Unfortunately, in the flesh, we mess up sometimes. But that's, that's what the law is for, is to help us get back on track. And our Father is a very forgiving God whenever you are genuinely apologetic and have a change of heart. Verse 11, to continue. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Paul, how was it committed to Paul's trust? On the road to Damascus. I mean, he, Paul's own desire was to destroy the church. But God took, uh, he, God didn't give him a choice. He struck him down and forced him, so to speak, to follow God's word. You might say, well, well I didn't know God would do that. Well, then you don't understand the first earth age. Paul earned the right to be one of God's chosen vessels, as Acts chapter 9, 15 stipulates. He was a chosen vessel for God to use as God saw fit. And so God did use him. He knew from the first earth age, Paul was very zealous. He didn't, he didn't go at something halfway. When Paul undertook a thing, it was all out, and God knew it. That was the same way it was in the first earth age when God chose him. So when God committed the word to the trust in Paul's trust, it couldn't have been in better hands. You see, Paul, don't underrate Paul. Paul was one of the better scholars. He studied at the feet of Gamia, one of the greatest scholars of that day. He, he knew the Old Testament inside and out. He was very informed. He just missed the point that Christ came of Mary and died on the cross. He missed that. But God had a way of catching him up with it. And so it was that he was uh, had all this truth committed to him. And he did well. God would utilize him to write a great deal of the New Testament that we so follow. Verse 12, And I think, <clears throat> I think Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Um, he made me able, is what Paul is saying. Again, you have to realize uh, anybody that does not understand predestination should take the life of Paul and look at it real close. Knowing what Paul's will was, but what God's will was. 
God's going to have it his way. But he will not, absolutely not, interfere in the life of a person <clears throat> that was not chosen in the first earth age. As we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Behold, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age, this eon of time. Why? And you were justified as it is written in Romans chapter 8. Why? God can move your life around. Why? Because you're already justified. You'll pay for your sin, but you're, you're justified. And he can interfere in your life and move you like he did Paul. But somebody that has free will, meaning they didn't overcome in the first age, God, unless they ask him to do a thing, he will not touch them. Why? Because on Judgment Day, they will throw it up to him saying, well, if you hadn't interfered in my life. But he will not interfere in someone's life with free will unless you ask. But God wants you to ask. Why? Because he loves you. Charity, love, is the greatest of all. Uh, the, the, the scripture that pops into my mind here for the one with free will that might think they've missed something, they haven't. God loves them. They just didn't cut it in the first earth age. Make sure you don't miss it in this one. But it was, um, would be Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, where God said, Hey, remind me of my promises so we can talk about it um, and I can justify you. That means I can help you and make it right. So whether you have free will or not, you've got to talk to him. You have to remind him. And with free will, that's the way you get his attention. Because he's not going to interfere in your life otherwise. I'm talking about election. He will interfere in your lives. Free will, he will not. Does he love one more than the other? Absolutely not. He's not a respecter of persons. And those that overcame in the first earth age are his servants. All they do is work for him to try to bring in line those with free will that they have eternal life. Verse 13, to continue. Who was before a blasphemer, and this Paul coming down himself, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I, I didn't know Christ had died on the cross. I didn't know he was born that virgin, of that virgin Mary. Though he was familiar with the scripture, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it stipulates very clearly, a virgin shall conceive and have a child, man child, and you will name him Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. Paul knew that. He said, I missed it. I should have known, but he didn't. But uh, I did it ignorantly in unbelief, so he wasn't accountable. God didn't hold that against him. That's that many times you do things, you young people that do things ignorantly, you young adults that do things ignorantly, it is forgivable, though you may think it isn't. If you do it in ignorance, it is forgivable. And, and you want to love God for that. Charity, love, is the greatest of all gifts. So what you do in unbelief, in ignorance, is forgivable. Verse 14. I mean, let's say it again. Paul, I mean, he was a bad character. He was, I mean, he, he, the church was afraid of him. That's why he had such a hard time working himself back into the church. That hey, he's the one that about ruined us. He, he was there when they stoned Stephen to death, holding the coats. And Stephen was so righteous. 14. And the grace, that's the unmerited favor, the love of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. He loved me. Naturally, you of God's elect must know this ties into the first earth age as well. 15. This is a faithful saying. The of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the worst one. 
In these three books that I mentioned, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, five times you will have this saying, this is a faithful saying. Five, of course, means grace. It is utilized five times. That is the purpose. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, he said. In flesh we all fall short. And Paul, he really persecuted the church. He, he wasn't putting on uh, lightly. He, he was severe with it. He had a letter in his pocket with permission from the chief Pharisees to destroy the church in Damascus, in Syria, and intended to do it until God stopped him, turned him around, and made a servant out of him. Verse 16, Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting and um, and what what you may think that you are undeserving but think of Paul who persecuted if anyone was undeserving he would have been but God changed his heart his mind and that servant came forth. Again, elect understand this. Some may have trouble with it. It's, um, you have to understand the ages. Verse 17. Now unto the king eternal. That means through the king throughout all ages. The first, this one, and the one to come. Immortal, immortal invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, that's the way it is. He's saying that. Giving, paying homage to our Heavenly Father for having straightened Him out, for having given Him the message of salvation. For who? For sinners. Why? God loves all of His children. Do you know what the duty of elect are? It's to do the bidding of Christ, and his bidding is to save sinners. To teach truth in a simple way, not making some great name for yourself, but making a name called the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that he, and in believing upon him, can bring you eternal life. Not, not some pit with fiery brimstone, that is uh, God the consuming fire, but give you peace, a perfect world with the firmament back in the place it should be. No storms, a perfect earth, rejuvenated as it is written in Revelation 21. Rejuvenated back to its original form, whereby you can have eternal life there. God wants you to participate in bringing and practicing that salvation. You know, you can take a little light and say, it's mine, mine, mine. I see that and I know I'm better than anyone. No, you're not better than anyone else. God is not a respecter of person. And if you want charity to move away from you, just have that attitude. Boy, it'll, God will drop you like a hot rock. Love overcomes all. This is not to say that you're not to be cautious and you're not to practice that against our enemy, but to save as many as you can in being fair and equitable in bringing forth the word of God, whereby the price is paid on the cross that they can participate in. That's a true saying. Verse 19 to continue. 18, rather, to continue. This charge... I commit unto thee, son Timothy, the, his spiritual son, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare against the wicked, against the evil, that you are brilliant enough that you can... You, what is the most powerful weapon in the world? The Word of God. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It can take the highest office in the land and cut him right down to smithereens. That is to say, spiritually speaking. 
when wrong is done, or when right is done to build them up, to be fair, to be equitable. Verse 19, holding faith. Now, now what, what is faith? With the gospel armor, I want you to think about it. It's your shield. And a good conscience, um, that's the breastplate. Have that right out in front of you. Which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And, and naturally, with um, Christ being that shield, you, and faith in him, you put him away, you're, gonna, you're going on the rocks, friend. You're sailing your little old ship right out into bad, bad country. And there's reefs and rocks aplenty. Christ protects. And Christ avoids shipwreck of your life. And pulls you back together. Gives you hope. Because you have faith in Him. And a clear conscience know you're doing the best you can. Verse 20 to complete the chapter. Of whom is Hymenius and uh, Alexander. They denied the resurrection there was any life after death whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme in other words I've turned them over to the devil he can beat them up till maybe they'll come around and that's what can happen to you you let Satan get a hold of one of God's elect when they pull away he will chew them up right real good Why? he's got everybody else and when you Stop casting your pearls before swine and just let them go to the devil. He can chew them up enough that they'll come right on back saying, Help me, help me, help me. Uh, Satan doesn't waste any time doing it. He knows God's elect. Why? He stood against them in the first earth age. He's got to do it again. Why did God choose them as the election? Because he knows they'll stand against Satan. It's, they, they, they abhor him. They do not find him tempting. They find him to be an abomination. And God knows that. And he can, he'll love you for that. That's what the war is about. Is those that would go against truth. That would take those freedoms away from us. That's worth fighting for, my friend. That's what warfare is. All right. First Timothy. How we should react. How a Christian should act. You've got it. First lecture, don't miss the next one. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please?